Hi everyone, uh, today we'll be doing our final uh, class presentation and in doing so we'll be doing a review of the uh, key ideas uh, from the course. So a little bit of background into and how we started to look at gender as a sociological concept and then we'll break it down by our three different uh, dimensions with respect to our sociological framework and you know all this information is useful information with respect to the final project of the semester where I ask you to you know bring together the three different dimensions of our course framework and tie it into gender in one way or another so overall just to get into our review we started by talking about how when we speak of gender, we distinguish it from sex. Uh, sex represents the kind of male, female, uh, biologically speaking. And then when we talk about gender, we're talking about the different meanings that we associate uh, with the sexes. Uh, femininity represents the meanings we associate with females. Uh, masculinity represents the meanings we associate with males. And then we talked about gender is not something that people have, but rather something that people do. Uh, gender is a performance that people give. And so when looking at the performances, people can give the kind of appropriate gendered expectation performance. You know, guys performing masculinity, uh, girls performing femininity. Or on the other hand, you can look at people who try to do more gender neutral uh, performances. Or on the other hand, you can see where people try to distance themselves from expectations. Thus, we can say that they are performing unanticipated gendered ways. And these performances are often unconscious. So this goes on without us even thinking about it. And it starts in the morning in terms of how we pick out our clothes. And it goes on through our, uh, throughout the days in terms of you know, how we think, uh, how we act. And so we say these performances are often very unconscious because we're so used to doing it that we don't have to think about doing it anymore. Although sometimes it can be a conscious kind of on the level of the awareness as well. Uh, the performance nevertheless can vary by context. Uh, the people you find yourself with, uh, the different situations, uh, both can influence uh, people giving one agenda performance or perhaps another. And like I mentioned a second ago, these performances kind of come to the surface in terms of how we present our bodies. I think back to the uh, making the biological social activity that we did earlier in the semester. The performances surface in terms of how we dress, uh, what we wear, perhaps what we don't wear, our uh, different tastes, uh, how we think and how we act. Gender can come to the surface in all these areas. And when we look at when gender does come to the surface, often it's operating to provide symbolic limitations. So we limit ourselves, we restrict ourselves to conforming to gender expectations. And so, you know, men kind of conform to masculinity, thus restrict ourselves uh, to ideas connected to maleness. And the same thing with women, when women are kind of following the expectations of femininity, what they're doing is they're limiting themselves to the meanings attached to uh, femaleness. And we can do this uh, socially as well as when we expect uh, other people to kind of stay within the gender boundaries. We are kind of limiting them symbolically speaking. And on the other hand, we can recognize that perhaps you're not limiting yourself to conforming to expectations, but rather you try to reject expectations. So you distance yourself from what's expected of you, you know, as a male or as a female. And in doing so, again, you're kind of limiting yourself uh, because you're trying to distance yourself from conforming to something. And thus, you're distancing yourself uh, from those traits as well. And so we can see kind of the symbolic limitations that people can impose on themselves, on other people. But also we can recognize the social inequalities that can emerge as well. 
And so we talked about how these are uh, differences, disparities between the sexes based upon gender expectations rather than differences, uh, disparities between the sexes based upon some sort of merit. So finally, we talked about how it's not enough to only recognize gender by itself in isolation, but also we need to recognize how it intersects, how it relates to other social variables, whether it be one's age, uh, one's racial category, uh, one's sexuality, uh, one's class background, or one's geography in terms of where you live. All these factors can come into play in terms of how you experience life socially or psychologically speaking. With that understanding of gender through that sociological lens, now we can recognize it in reference to our course framework, uh, looking at the cultural foundations, moving into the social psychological foundations, and then ending with the institutional dimensions and looking at each one individually, but also how all three dimensions of our coursework uh, relate to one another, the interplay among the three. So when we look at the cultural foundations of gender, we're looking at that external social force of culture uh, that provides us those meanings we associate uh, with the sexes. So it's our culture, specifically kind of the gender dimension of our culture, and that provides us the meanings that we associate uh, with maleness, with femaleness. It's not knowledge that we're born with, but rather it's knowledge that we learn only when we're exposed to uh, gendered cultural ways. And these different ways, these different meanings are fluid and they will change over place. So they'll differ in terms of the meanings we associate with the sexes from one place to another and they will change uh, over time. So something may be normative gender-wise at one time period, but in a different time period, normative expectations with respect to gender uh, will change. So all in all, we can say that gender culture provides people uh, the rules of the game, uh, the rules of the game when it comes to what we expect out of ourselves, what we expect out of other people uh, based on their sex. And so again, these meanings are fluid, so not only do they change over place and time, but again, they can change based upon the person, based upon the groups of individuals as well. But overall, we kind of recognize that the gender culture uh, does provide us those rules of the game when it comes to what we expect out of people and what we expect out of ourselves uh, based upon our sex. And we can say that the game itself uh, is rigged. It's a rigged game in the sense that it privileges uh, one sex. Thus, with that privileging of one group, you're going to disadvantage other people. And so here, the one group that gets the privilege, that gets the advantage, is men. And it's because kind of the rules are, wit are written in their favor in terms of the meanings we associate with masculinity uh, kind of outweigh both symbolically and socially speaking uh, the meanings outweigh the meanings we associate uh, with women, with femininity. You know, the leader gets more symbolic and social respect uh, than the supporter. And so when you start to see all those different relations in terms of how gender kind of divides meanings up between the two sexes, then you can recognize how the game is rigged from the get-go. If you play by the rules, more often than not, uh, the men are going to get advantage and the women are going to get disadvantaged, thus the game is rigged. The second dimension of our course framework looks at the social psychological foundations of gender. So here we're looking at how we take that external uh, gender culture and we internalize the culture, uh, make it part of our social psychological makeup and when you connect the external cultural force to our internal uh, psychological makeup and then what we're going to do is be making that external force a real force in the sense that if you never learn the rules of the game uh, you're not going to be playing by the rules of the game but once you do kind of learn the rules and begin to play by them then you make that external culture real and its influences 
uh, real in its consequences. So again, sometimes this is on a conscious level, and more often than not, you know, once we learn the rules of the game, we don't think about them, but they still guide our actions and thoughts unconsciously. Uh, so here we begin to see ourselves, uh, we begin to see other people, uh, not as people, but again as gender people. We see them in terms of their maleness and femaleness that we associate uh, with their sex. So we use the gender beliefs that again we tie to one sex to kind of understand who they are in relation to ourselves, who we are in relation to other people. And again, sometimes you can try to stay within these gender boundaries. Uh, other times you can try to reject them and distance yourself uh, from the gender beliefs. But either way, you show how gender is having an influence on people when they are trying to play by the rules or when they are trying to reject the rules in one form or another. The distancing, uh, the conforming shows how gender is influencing how people think, uh, how people are acting. And we can also recognize that, you know, sometimes we personally may reject uh, kind of gendered standards for ourselves, perhaps for the close people around us. But by default, typically we rely on the normative gender expectations when we don't know people. Uh, acquaintances, strangers, we typically resort on that default understanding of people uh, connected to gender to kind of understand what these people may be about, to kind of go about our kind of social uh, navigations with them. But, uh, you know, when we get to know people, so when they're no longer an acquaintance or a stranger, we rely less and less on gender beliefs because we start to know them for who they really are. So the more we get to know people, the less we rely on uh, gender beliefs in that type of relationship. So overall, we can say that gender social psychology, in terms of inequality, often puts in practice the same understandings that promote the inequality to begin with. So if the game is rigged, and we're playing the game in terms of how it's meant to be played, that here you're putting in the practice, the cultural understandings, uh, the rules of the game that promote that inequality uh, between the sexes. The third piece of the puzzle, the institutional dimension of gender, is an important uh, piece of the puzzle with respect to it connects the framework all together. You know, there's a relationship to culture, there's a relationship to social psychology. So although we conclude the semester with looking at institutions, one could argue that maybe it's the most important dimension because it's where the culture is coming from, is where people are learning the cultural ways, and it's within these spaces that a lot of the inequality is emerging. So when looking at institutions, and institutions provide us a space in which gender is being produced. So that gender culture, uh, the rules of the game, uh, the meanings we associate with the sexes, is, pe is being produced in these institutional spaces, uh, whether it be parents producing the culture, uh, teachers, uh, writers. The meanings, the ideas are being produced within these institutions, you know, such as the family, uh, such as religion, education, media, uh, government. And people within the institution, whether it be the official agents, the parents, the teachers, the uh, writers, the politicians, or other people within those spaces, our peers, uh, other family members, uh, for example, they're producing and they're teaching both informally and formally that gender culture. And so here we see the production of culture, but also the institution provides us the space in which we are encountering and learning the gender culture, whether it be the you know, books that we're reading, the uh, living room in which we're you know, learning certain things, or the uh, classroom where we're being exposed to certain gender ideas. So not only do the institutions produce the culture and provide us those spaces for socialization, they also uh, organize people around different social factors, uh, such as sex. And as I'll say in my next slide, 
this is important because when you start to separate people, it's easier to separate them in terms of a different type of socialization. You can socialize people differently when you provide them different social spaces to which they're going to be socialized. And then also you can recognize how inequality can emerge from that in terms of separating people into different spaces and allocating different social status, uh, different uh, financial standings in those different positions, thus creating the inequality. Now looking at all three of our course dimensions and the interplay among them, we can see again the significance of institutions with respect to producing that culture and providing this a space in which we are making that culture a part of our social psychology. So producing gender culture, we link institutions and culture together, uh, providing the spaces in which we learn and we internalize that gender culture. We are linking institutions to social psychology. So again, you know, here are the three different components and how they relate to each other what I ask you to talk about, what I ask you to highlight in that final project of the semester. And so again, you start to see not only the three pieces here, but also how institutions will organize the sexes into different spaces. And this makes it a lot easier to promote that gender socialization when you have the sexes into different spaces, rather if the sexes are sharing the same space makes it more problematic to try to socialize people differently when you find themselves to be in the same spaces compared to if you put people into different spaces it makes it much easier to socialize them differently. Uh, to conclude we can look at how you know recognizing all three parts of our sociological framework and the functions of each part individually, but also how the three parts come together in terms of the interconnection, we can start to recognize how change is possible. So if you know how things work, then it makes it easier to do something differently in terms of promoting change as a whole. So kind of recognizing how things work with respect to culture, social psychology institutions to promote something different, to promote change, we need to start rearranging those three parts of the puzzle. And here what we're talking about in terms of the ultimate goal kind of would be minimizing uh, trying to decrease the symbolic limitations that come with gender and trying to decrease and minimize the social inequalities that come with gender as well. What we need to kind of focus on is how we want to degender the gendered culture. And by that, basically, you know, try to take away meanings that we associate with one sex or the other and to simply associate meanings uh, for people. That's what we were looking at in terms of something degendered. And so, again, we've talked about in class uh, certain things such as a college student, such as uh, a piece of clothing, such as a hoodie. You know, these things are de-gender, gender-neutral aspects of culture. And when you start to have that kind of gender-neutral, de culture, then people have the free will to, you know, pursue a college career or not. Compared to if college was only seen for men, then women were socially, symbolically limited to not make that choice. Or if you were making that choice, you're limited in terms of the actual studies you could be doing. And the same thing with clothing. If you make a clothing that's for people to wear, then you have the option more to wear that type of clothing compared to if the clothing uh, made specifically for one sex or the other. So when we start to degenerate the culture, we were making meanings for people rather than meanings for one sex or the other. And here again, we're not trying to change people. So we're not trying to make you know men or women look differently or act differently. But what we're actually doing is providing people more freedom to live how they want to live. Live according to their choice rather than living according to expectations that are tied to their sex. So men can you know, choose what they want to do career-wise, uh, wear what they want to do clothing-wise. Women can choose what they want to do 
uh, career-wise, wear what they wanted to wear, clothing-wise, based upon their actual choice, their personal kind of styles, rather than being influenced directly, indirectly, by cultural expectations that are tied into you being a male or being a female. So you get this kind of promotion of freedom. The more gender neutral the culture is, uh, the more degender the culture is as a result. So you're not trying to make people the same. In reality, you're actually probably going to be creating more difference because you're allowing people to do what they want to do rather than trying to make them uh, conform or perhaps reject a certain gender expectations. And as a result, when you start to have people kind of doing what they want to do and how they want to do it, rather than people following the rules of the gendered game, inequalities will still exist. But the inequalities will be based upon uh, personal choice, you choosing to do something or choosing not to do it, and the inequalities will be based upon merit, uh, one's kind of ability to you know deserve it rather than something being handed to them or taken away from them uh, based upon gender expectations. So again, we're not trying to get rid of inequality as a whole, but replace the inequality, uh, the false inequality, based upon gender expectations with inequality that's now based upon personal choice and inequality now based upon merit.